organized organized by the um, um, SK India Science Working Group on UR and technology. And as a um, two week long uh, school, um, we thought that it will be uh, good to have a special uh, lecture for the participants to uh, learn about um, SKA and India's participation in SKA. And uh, I'm very glad that uh, Professor Jashwan Gupta has um, kindly agreed to deliver this talk today um, in the school. Um, so um, a very brief uh, introduction of the speaker. So um, Jashwan did his uh, bachelor in electrical engineering from IIT Kanpur and then um, his MS and PhD from UCSD, University of California, San Diego. Um, he is um, currently uh, serving as the director of the National Center for Radio Astrophysics uh, for more than four years now and, um, you know, and working at NCRA for more than 30 years now. Um, his uh, key uh, science interest is uh, pulsar and related physics and astrophysics, um, as well as um, radio astronomical um, instrumentation um, and uh, application of that. And he is uh, very heavily involved in um, the square kilometer array initiative, particularly leading um, the initiatives related to Indian participation uh, in SKA. Um, and of course, um, needless to say that on top of that, he is uh, uh, also um, fulfilling the job as the center director in terms of running the, the upgraded GMRT and all the um, excellent um, uh, upgradation work that has happened recently um, and so on. Um, so he he is involved in all of these in a very uh, leading position. Uh, so today he will be telling us about uh, the square kilometer array and India's participation in it. Uh, so over to you, Yashwan. Right. So uh, so thank you. Can you uh, all hear me? All right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So so thank you, Nirupam, for the, your very generous comments and also for reminding me for the number of years I have been around here, but, uh, but coming uh, on a more uh, uh, relevant note that uh, since this meeting is um, uh, uh, co-sponsored by the uh, SK India Consortium and uh, you all have been discussing lots of details about uh, uh, the ins and outs of EOR and as you know that EOR is one of the primary goals of the SKA. Uh, so it's uh, it only makes sense to to discuss a little bit more about the SKA and but in particular about Indian participation in the SKA, and so that really is what my presentation will focus on. First part will be about the SKA, and second part will be uh, in the process. I'll give you an uh, a view of what the status is of the project overall, and then we'll talk about India's participation. And uh, uh, so I hope you can see the slides. All right. Yes. Yes. Okay, so uh, so the first part, like I said, about the SKA, and very simply put, it is the most ambitious radio astronomy project uh, attempted so far. And uh, one way to look at how big a project is, is to put it on this uh, line, uh, which shows the um, improvement in the uh, relative sensitivity uh, of radio telescopes uh, from the early days when the first serious radio astronomy telescope was built. And as you can see this uh, 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 progression, uh, you can uh, see where the SKA is uh, put on this scale, uh, well above anything that exists. Uh, this is when the JMRT was built, the upgraded JMRT is uh, one notch higher up on this uh, scale, but still uh, well below the full SKA. So uh, in order to get there, what is uh, projected in the final SKA is one square kilometer of collecting area. That's why it's called the square kilometer array, which just to give you a sense for those of you who say, for example, have used the GMRT, will be 30 times the GMRT in terms of collecting area. So, uh, so you would say then that's like of the order of thousand dishes of the size of GMRT. 
but actually it will consist of uh, antennas which are uh, smaller than the 45 meter size GMRT antenna. So there, in the final configuration, they'll be of the order of 3000 uh, uh, of the order of 15 meter size antennas. Uh, and um, uh, but there's also a, a complementary part of the low frequency part, which is of uh, dipole antennas. And I will talk about that later on. And uh, it will, of course, uh, have much higher resolution than any of the existing facilities. So antennas will be spread out over uh, uh, thousands of kilometers kind of distances in the final configuration and a much wider frequency range than any of the individual radio astronomy facilities provides today. Uh, as you can see, that's a very large range from 70 megahertz to 10 gigahertz. And uh, it, uh, in order to really get the best out of all this, it will be located in the most radio quiet regions that you can uh, put such large arrays, uh, which happen to be in, the, uh, in Australia and South Africa. And we'll see some of these details uh, in, in a moment. And of course, with this kind of uh, configuration, it promises uh, cutting edge science in all frontline areas, which also, again, we'll look at briefly. And a very brief uh, current status is that it has completed the design phase uh, of what is SK phase one. I'll explain in a moment what is SK phase one. And the construction of SK phase one is expected to start by later this year. In fact, we may expect the announcement of the commencement of uh, construction to happen uh, later this week, in fact, but uh, we'll see how that uh, uh, meeting of the SK council goes. And uh, the expected to finish around 2027 have a fully functional facility uh, doing uh, uh, working at its full cap uh, capacity by 2030 or so. And uh, so uh, in, in that context, uh, it will take its place amongst uh, the uh, uh, all the, uh, the, the pantheon of these major facilities of the 21st century uh, covering different uh, as uh, parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, going from uh, and 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 beyond in terms of uh, uh, the going even to the uh, complementing the gravitational wave observatory. So you can see here uh, the different large facilities uh, that are um, either just become operational or going to be launched soon or just finished design and starting construction now. And. Uh, the science with SKA is uh, very wide ranging, all the way from the formation of the first stars and galaxies in the universe, which is what uh, the, the UOR study is concerned about, to these, uh, to all different aspects of astrophysics uh, in different realms of the universe, uh, and going all the way beyond that to things which are a little bit out of uh, you know, the traditional astrophysics, like, for example, searching for the origins of life and also looking for extraterrestrial intelligence. And uh, so um, uh, these are the details. Uh, and, uh, you know, all of this is available in documented form as to what are the areas of science. But uh, as you can see here, all the way from cosmic dawn and EOR to cosmology, dark energy, galaxy evolution, origin and evolution of cosmic magnetism, transient radio sky, strong field tests of gravity with pulsars and black holes, cradle of life in astrobiology. And uh, last but not the least, when you build a facility which is five to 10 times better than anything that exists, uh, you're likely to make unexpected new discoveries and serendipity always plays a role uh, in such things. And uh, so um, uh, and so now I'll just briefly uh, you know flash through some of these things so this is an example of what the ska will be able to do uh, in terms of studying protoplanetary disks so you will uh, be able to resolve uh, the things which were not possible uh, today and be able to address uh, some of these uh, questions uh, uh, you know about the kind of uh, composition that you have for these uh, protoplanetary disks and uh, uh, when it comes to pulsars, there's of the order of 10 to the 5 pulsars mm -hmm. expected to be in a galaxy and of which we know only of the order of 10 to the 3 today. And so SK is expected to uh, take that number uh, to uh, of the order of uh, 10 to the 4, like 30,000 normal pulsars, uh, 2,000 millisecond pulsars. And, and, and when you do such a large number, you are uh, likely to discover some of the more exotic uh, members of the species. Uh, whether it be relativistic binaries or pulsar black hole binaries and uh, and uh, things like that, maybe even the first extragalactic pulsar. So all of these are within the realm of the SKA. 
and uh, from there to the uh, business of gravitational waves. So uh, low frequency uh, uh, gravitational waves are best detected with uh, pulsar timing. Uh, and, and that's a uh, niche area where uh, uh, radio astronomy uh, can play a major role. And there's uh, major initiatives uh, around the globe to try and do this with the uh, regular systematic timing of radio pulsars. In fact, this week, there is a meeting of the International Pulsar Timing Array that's going on, which is talking about how close is uh, pulsar timing to uh, declaring the detection of uh, gravitational wave signal. Uh, so, um, as from there, sorry, I jumped one page. Uh, uh, then the uh, understanding uh, magnetism uh, all the way from our galaxy to nearby galaxies uh, and to galaxy clusters and the cosmic web. And uh, so you can see the comparison between existing surveys and what the SKA will be able to do in these areas. And uh, then, of course, this I won't spend any time because this is what you are all experts and, and learning about. Um, so the what is the square kilometer array? So it's actually uh, three sites, uh, two I mentioned already, uh, um, you know, Australia and South Africa, where the two halves of the telescope, and we'll see what the two halves are, are located. And there's a global headquarters, which is located in the UK. So that together forms one observatory. And uh, like I said, the design phase uh, completed. And uh, the phase one, and I'll just come to what uh, phase one will uh, consist of, uh, as I mentioned already, the construction phase. And uh, it will also integrate one of the existing facilities in South Africa called the Mirkat, which some of you will be familiar with. It will uh, be subsumed and become part of the SKA uh, by adding its 64 antennas into the array. And then there's a plan for a phase two, uh, depending on how phase one goes, to really get to that full one square kilometer array. So that really brings us to, uh, you know, what is phase one? So phase one is a slightly restricted uh, scope. Uh, with a slightly restricted frequency coverage, uh, restricted uh, length of the maximum baselines, so but still going up to 150 kilometers. Uh, but all design considerations keeping in mind that someday we may want to expand this to the full SK. So, you know, how you bring infrastructure to the place, how you bring power, and uh, how do you, you know, plan so that uh, it can be incrementally expanded later on. And so, as I mentioned, the two sites and the global headquarters. And uh, we talked about uh, all of this already. And uh, so this is what uh, the site locations are like. So this is the location for SKA mid. So I, I should clarify that, that that frequency range is further split into two uh, halves because no single radio astronomy uh, telescope can really cover such a large frequency range uh, easily. So it's split into two. The lower frequency, which is now roughly 50 to 300 megahertz, is called SKA low, and the, the higher part of that is called SKA mid. Uh, and so the SKA mid uh, is a more conventional design using uh, antennas or dishes uh, with uh, 200 antennas uh, to be spread out over 150 kilometer region. And uh, uh, this these, these timelines are slightly outdated now. This is more like from 2021 to 2026 or so. And this is located in a semi-desert region uh, where there is very little population density, about 800 kilometers north of uh, Cape Town. And um, uh, this is where the Meerkat is also located. And uh, this is an excellent site for radio astronomy, as is this site in Western Australia on the edge of the Great Australian Desert, uh, which uh, is again 800 kilometers from Perth. And uh, here the design is different from traditional dish antennas. It's uh, uh, the basic antenna is a dipole, and uh, there are uh, collections of dipoles uh, in a cluster in in what is called a station. So, and then there are multiple such stations again spanning over this 80 kilometer region. So you can uh, very roughly you can think of the station as the equivalent of a single dish or an antenna, and an array of stations equivalent to an array of antennas. Uh, but there's more to that because you can do other kinds of sophisticated processing uh, of within the dipoles in a station and uh, get uh, do things which is not easily possible with uh, the dish antenna. 
and uh, then the last part of it, which is the headquarters. Uh, this is the new headquarter building in the, at the, of the SKO, uh, you know, located uh, at the Jodel Bank Observatory. So this is the old um, uh, granddaddy of radio astronomy, the Jodel Bank uh, Radio Observatory, um, which, um, uh, so this is where the project will be uh, managed from in terms of the overall uh, uh, management. And um, as you can imagine that uh, when you talk about the kind of capabilities that we talked about, uh, the to make those happen, you will be pushing the technology envelope in many areas. And so whether it is advanced and diversified antenna design principles, or uh, you know, uh, sophisticated uh, low noise electronics, uh, extensive fiber network uh, which goes over petabits per second, which is more than the total internet traffic today. Uh, supercomputing capability of uh, petaflops to process the data, and a very sophisticated uh, management and control software system in order to manage this distributed observatory uh, and make it work in a coordinated fashion. And then finally, when you get the data to make sense of the data uh, from the point of view of extracting the best quality science from it, then all kinds of techniques, uh, uh, including modern things like machine learning and uh, uh, AI will uh, get really into play in uh, trying to get the best out of the, uh, the, the data. And so this is just an example, again, illustrating the, uh, the level of technology that is involved. And um, in terms of whether uh, you count the uh, going number of antennas of SKA from SK1 to SK2, the comparisons are shown, uh, but uh, the more crucial things are these, the, how much data has to be transported over the short range. Short range uh, means from the antennas to the central, and then from the central to the final place where you want to finally analyze the data and store it. And then the actual uh, processing capability required to do the processing and the you know kind of uh, software engineering and algorithms to be developed and then the computing at the back end for the actual analysis and uh, producing the images and then finally the storage requirements okay so all of these are quite significant and last but not the least in order to do all this uh, you need power and so you can see here numbers of the order of you know megawatts required to run the observatory and uh, so uh, I uh, at this point this gets a bit more technical in detail, so I won't spend too much time. But just just to show that how the range of frequencies will be covered by different receivers, uh, and the thing here is that uh, you know one gigahertz kind and two and a half gigahertz kind of bandwidths at these frequencies are a challenging uh, uh, to achieve, and uh, and that too with the low noise performance, and all of this is being attempted now for the SK. And this is just an example of this data flow challenge in terms of how much data comes from SK low or SK mid and uh, what you need for the real time computation for processing the data and then what you need for the, uh, the storage uh, for the data. And then finally, you slap this issue, how do you get this large volumes of data to the final user communities, which is spread out all over the world. And I'll show that in a minute. Uh, having problems today with this. Uh, getting stuck. Hmm. Okay, I seem to have a problem with my computer not uh, responding. Maybe you can just close the application and... Yeah, I think it. I may have to just close it and then start. So can you use the keyboard instead of mouse? Yeah, no, I mean, I was trying to do that. This, I mean, there's a very slow yeah. way of doing it. Okay, yeah. uh, it was not advancing. The, the, the arrow key should work. Yeah, no, the arrow key is not working. That's what I'm just seeing. The arrow key is giving me some trouble. Then space, okay. then space bar. Yeah. yeah. So, so anyway, so this is just a comparison of the storage requirement vis-a-vis -vis, uh, things that you're more uh, sort of familiar with, whether it is Google or Facebook or whatever. And you can see that, uh, you know, compared to, and these are, you know, huge 
uh, databases that these uh, things have to maintain, but uh, compared to them, uh, the SK really goes one level uh, higher, okay? And uh, then finally, as I said, this data has to come to all over the world. And so there are plans for regional data centers at different locations uh, around the globe uh, so that they can host some or all of the SKA data and make it available more easily to the community. And so, for example, we, there, uh, there are plans to have one such regional center in India. So, And this is how this would move on uh, the undersea cables. And there are, again, things about how much it costs to move the data and, uh, and uh, how it will be funded and so on. And then finally, as I was saying, that there is a uh, whole, uh, fairly major issue of end-to-end -end management of the observatory, uh, all the way from uh, the user submitting a, a proposal uh, to uh, the, that proposal being processed and uh, accepted and scheduled on the telescope and the actual observation run and managed in real time, ensuring that that data has come through correctly, uh, initial processing of the data, and then finally making the data available uh, to the user. So that's the entire end-to-end -end, uh, system. And that is uh, what is called the telescope manager. And that actually happens to be one of the main areas where India has uh, been contributing and will continue to contribute. And like I said, the last part, the power challenge is not trivial, uh, so much so that uh, seriously alternative uh, green energy options are being explored to see whether uh, and, in, and especially in SKA low site, there's already a uh, solar plant running, uh, which powers uh, some of the facilities there. And uh, this brings us to who are the people who are uh, doing all this. And so that's a global partnership. Uh, these are the main countries that are involved uh, or have been involved and uh, continue to be there. There are others who are joining, like, for example, Portugal has now sort of joined formally this group and Switzerland is uh, about to join. And so the partnership is growing uh, with the different uh, countries uh, becoming interested in taking, uh, being part of it. And uh, in terms of how it's managed, so during the design phase, uh, which is now ending, uh, the uh, project was managed by a not-for-profit company registered in the UK, and we were all members uh, of the board of the company and uh, the the activities were managed via that, but for a, a long-term large-scale project, that is not a feasible way. And so it is transitioning into an intergovernmental organization bound by international treaty. And so all of that has been worked out. And uh, there are now uh, member countries who have joined the treaty. And uh, the final uh, SKA Observatory Council has been formed, uh, uh, which was around the beginning of uh, this year. And uh, it has now started taking over the job of um, uh, getting the work for the construction started and the long-term management of the project. And uh, so this list is, again, slightly old. Now China has completed the process of joining. And uh, so this is growing. Uh, uh, Sweden, Canada, and India amongst the original uh, countries that negotiated the uh, documents for the treaty, uh, the three countries that are yet uh, to complete this process and join uh, are Sweden, Canada, and India. And we'll talk a bit more later about uh, the plans of India. As I said, this started uh, in early this year, and uh, the next meeting is actually uh, in the th on Thursday and Friday of this week. So, um, just to again give an overview of the status and timelines the design was completed march 2020 and the proposal to build the sko was then developed and it was recently approved uh, in the uh, by the council and as i said uh, 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 this week uh, the council may give the go ahead for kickoff of the construction phase starting from next month um, and uh, this will be uh, the this end of construction around 2027 uh, with uh, periodic array releases. That is, uh, as you know, that uh, interferometry uh, observatory is something where you can start with the core of antennas and keep adding and keep growing. And uh, you, know, you can start uh, doing early things with even the small set of uh, antennas. And so there will be array releases uh, all the way from 2024 onwards. Uh, till the final release when the full system is available. 
and this commissioning and early signs uh, is this period from 2026 onwards when uh, you can start doing some serious science experiments to see how the observatory is behaving uh, and regular operations expected to start by 2028 and like i said by 2030 to have a fully smoothly working observatory uh, doing frontline science so with that i'll just move on and talk a bit about uh, what uh, is uh, been uh, india's role and participation in the sk so far and uh, what is it that we are aiming for unless somebody has any quick question about the uh, overall sk at this point i'm happy to take that otherwise we can move on and we can uh, still take it later on if you want okay uh, i so, don't see any raised hand yeah. at this point all right so uh, again i think most of you uh, would know and understand this, that uh, India has a strong tradition in radio astronomy from the 1960s. And uh, there has been uh, international level work done in India, uh, be it in terms of building uh, world class facilities, um, uh, such as the UT radio telescope and the giant meter wave radio telescope, as well as uh, work in both, uh, um, you know, theoretical uh, uh, aspects, as well as observational aspects by astronomers from the country and uh, in some sense uh, the thing that we often end up talking about most is the JMRT because it is the facility which is as I'll show in a moment one step below SKA phase one in terms of capabilities and if you can sort of uh, build and use and uh, do science uh, with the uh, with the upgraded JMRT uh, then you are in a good position to be able to uh, you know, uh, contribute to the SKA phase one. And so in that sense, the GMRT has been officially recognized by the SKA um, organization as a pathfinder facility, both in terms of the science and, in, and the technology developments which are relevant for SKA. And so this is the one that actually shows you that. So this is the sensitivity for uh, uh, imaging kind of an exercise and the frequency coverage. And so you see the upgraded GMRT uh, having this kind of a, uh, coverage uh, over the range of frequencies that it operates. And then you see SKA low and SKA mid. So this you can see that uh, really is a stepping stone uh, to get there uh, with the complementary facilities like the JVLA at the uh, higher end of the frequency spectrum. And of course, there now there is Meerkat, which occupies a region uh, somewhere over, over here. And, and by the way, this also shows you that jump, which is uh, from the 10% of the SK to full SK, the SK1 to SK phase two. And uh, so uh, there is a lot of experience uh, working in other international projects as well. And uh, this is a strong and vibrant community in the country. And uh, that makes us uh, uh, well-placed to participate in the SK. And that's what we have been doing. Uh, so even in the early days, uh, there was a preparatory SK phase in 2010-11. Uh, we started uh, thinking about things that we could do. And we put forward a concept uh, design for the SKA monitor control system, which became the telescope manager. This concept design was accepted by the SKA. And we then, uh, once we joined the SKA organization, we were given the charge of developing the full design for the telescope manager and this happened once india joined as a full member of the uh, this old sk organization uh, with the department of atomic energy representing the government of india and uh, so this is from uh, that time in october 2015 when the sk director general and the secretary dae uh, uh, signed the agreement and over those uh, years, since that time, 2014 to 15, uh, we have made significant uh, contributions and developed in many different ways uh, in, uh, uh, in the participation in SKA. And uh, all of these activities are coordinated by the SK India Consortium. Uh, and these activities are, of course, funded by the DAE uh, against a proposal that we had submitted in 2014 for the work in the design phase. And so the SK India Consortium, I think the next one should be talking about the SK India Consortium, yes. And so this now has more than 20 institutions from the country, which are members. And so if your institution is not there, uh, you should do some legwork and uh, and do the lobbying and, and join the SK India Consortium. Um, and so it has uh, uh, 
all kinds of institutions, all the major astronomy research institutions, many of the IITs, ISERs, uh, universities, and even some of the smaller colleges. And each SK India Consortium member has one representative in the SK India uh, Consortium Council, which is the main body that meets and takes uh, the majority decisions about uh, what kind of activities uh, should be supported and how they should be taken care of and uh, funded and so on. And uh, we also allow for uh, individuals uh, who, so if you can't succeed in getting your organization to join, but would still like to participate, then you can join as an individual member, which is called associate member. And we welcome uh, such members also. Um, and so uh, all of this uh, is then geared towards uh, two main uh, areas of activity. One is the science, uh, which is a science subcommittee, um, which is uh, which is taken care of by Tirthankar, who I'm sure is there um, in the call and uh, is guiding uh, much of this workshop. And uh, it coordinates all the uh, science uh, working groups. And there are now basically uh, working groups which sort of mirror the international SK science working groups. Um, uh, but they are, uh, you know, the national um, science working groups uh, where uh, if you're interested in a particular area of science, you're welcome to join that science working group and contribute. And then the technical subcommittee, which coordinates the uh, uh, participation in the uh, technical activities, uh, in the uh, for example, the design work and now the prototyping work that's going on right now. And uh, so the SK, like I said, the SK science work uh, has really grown uh, from these early days when the SK India Consortium was set up. And one of the major steps was in December 2016, when uh, the SK India Consortium produced the first version of the SK India Science Case, which was published in the JAA. And uh, anybody who's not seen it should uh, go take a look, because this really uh, was the uh, foundation of uh, developing the science case for India. It has since been refined uh, a couple of times and um, uh, using, uh, you know, the different opportunities. And most recently, when we prepared the detailed project proposal for Indian participation in the construction phase, uh, the latest updated version of this uh, SK India science case uh, was uh, was produced and it's available. Um, and uh, and I'll probably uh, talk a bit more about that. Uh, but uh, uh, what this has done is to bring together uh, of the order of 100 faculty postdoc students from these uh, 20 odd and more institutions involved in this exercise. And uh, we hope to uh, uh, more than double this by the time uh, SKA1 uh, is ready for early science. And so, um, in addition to our own science working groups, many of the members from India are uh, participants in the uh, SKA uh, global science working groups. And uh, some of them are even uh, taking on uh, roles like uh, chairing the working groups. And uh, th there is, a, uh, so all of this is sort of uh, combined with the theoretical studies, a lot of which is related to the prospects of detections of EOR, simulations, and then the use of the existing Pathfinder and the precursor facilities of SKA, such as the UGMRT, for carrying out experiments, uh, which uh, would, of course, produce some initial science, but would also prime uh, people to be ready to use the SKA more effectively when it is ready. And so th this, if you want to have a look at the recent uh, SKA science case, uh, it is available uh, with appropriate links uh, at the uh, appropriate location on the NCRA homepage. And so this was one of the important events, which again spurred the growth of uh, science, SK science activities in India when we hosted the international uh, SK science meeting in uh, November 2016 in Goa. Um, and, uh, so I'll move from there and talk a bit about uh, what has been happening in the technical activities. And uh, as I mentioned, during the design phase, uh, we were uh, quite active in uh, different things. Uh, we were involved in three of the design work packages uh, where uh, we were the lead country for the telescope manager work package, which I briefly talked about. And there were some contributions in the central signal processing and uh, the signal and data transport uh, systems uh, for the 
as a design phase. And a lot of this uh, work that uh, we have been doing, especially for the telescope manager, has been done in collaboration with uh, research groups uh, and industry partners, uh, because this is the thing that uh, one has to keep in mind that when you want to build a full-scale SKA, it cannot be built uh, just by people from uh, the research institutions and laboratories. It has to have a significant participation from industry just given the size and the scale of what has to be built, whether it is in hardware or in software. And so this is something that we realized from the beginning and we have been engaging with Indian industry, uh, even from the design phase so that they are more prepared uh, for being valuable and active partners during the construction phase. And so the telescope manager, as I mentioned earlier, is really one of the critical systems because it's the end-to-end -end management system. So it's like the brain and the nerve center uh, of the entire observatory. Uh, and it's uh, uh, fairly complex uh, in terms of what all it has to handle. And it interacts with every other uh, uh, element or system of the observatory, and, and which is, uh, you know, really makes it uh, central and its design has to be done very carefully. So uh, uh, this is also an important thing because uh, we are not alone in this. So although we are the lead country, we were partnering with uh, six other member countries who along, uh, who each had their own sort of institutions participating. Some of them also had industry partners participating. So it was like a big group that one had to manage uh, internationally across different time zones and different cultures and different ways of working. And uh, we did all of that and we uh, completed the design and I'll talk a bit more about it. But one of the things, of course, when we do these is to ask that what you're contributing to an international project, uh, what benefit can it bring to your own um, uh, uh, projects in your own facilities? And so one of the things we did was to, we needed a new monitor control system for the upgraded GMRT. And we uh, did this design in synergy so that the ideas that we will be using for the uh, SKA uh, design uh, can be uh, then also utilized to deliver a next generation system for GMRT, which has actually happened. And that is the system that we are now using at the GMRT Observatory now for some time. And so this, I won't go into the details of all this, that uh, uh, what kind of software platforms and other things this involves, but uh, um, sorry. Uh, And uh, so, okay, so this was a design that we completed successfully. We were one of the first design consortia to finish the design around the middle of 2018. And uh, this was something that was really appreciated by the SKA office. And it also made uh, big news in the country in terms of one of the major uh, contributions from India to the design of the SKA. And um, then, uh, we, like I said, we also contributed to a couple of other work packages. And uh, we have now a good model for how to work uh, with industry and research organizations in the country for doing this. And that brings uh, me to this, that what is it that we are doing now and what do we plan to do in the construction phase? So after we finish the design phase, we have uh, contributed actively to the ongoing bridging phase, which uh, allows uh, you know, early prototypes to be built uh, based on the designs and try them out. And uh, in the process, we've also now joined the SKA Low uh, Station Digital um, System as one of the areas that we will be contributing, building the digital uh, electronics for the SKA Low. And there also we are now working with our colleagues from Italy for doing some of the early prototyping work in the labs in India and understanding how these systems uh, work so that we are ready for getting them mass produced by industry in India and uh, supplying integrated uh, units uh, to the SKA low uh, observatory. And this is something also is interesting that uh, the SKA um, has been carrying out these data challenges and some of you who are attending this workshop uh, may actually know about it, may also be involved. I know that uh, Nirupam has been coordinating uh, this effort on behalf of the SK India Consortium. And uh, so there's, uh, you know, teams from India 
who participated in the data challenge one and now a large number of teams from India participating in data challenge two. And you may ask, what are these data challenges if you haven't heard about them? This is like simulated data that is generated and made available and hopefully later will be replaced with some real life data. And then uh, you learn how to uh, you know, do science with it, whether it is extracting sources or trying to, you know, understand the properties of what you detect and, and so on. And so this is, again, all part of gearing up the community to be able to use the SKA. And I guess at some point, uh, there should, probably will be a EOR specific data challenge, uh, probably. And so uh, I can then towards the end of what is our current planning and position. So uh, going towards the construction phase, uh, these are the areas that we hope to contribute uh, to the building of the SKA. So, and some of, and most of these are already sort of agreed upon within the SKA and provisionally allocated uh, to uh, our role has been provisionally allocated and identified. So, as the lead country for the enhanced telescope manager, which is now called the OMC, the Observatory Monitor Control System, uh, which is more than what the original telescope manager design was. And uh, India has been identified as a lead country with the four other countries that we'll be working in partnership with and uh, uh, with uh, um, the lead institution from India will be NCRA with others uh, from the SK India consortium were interested and partners from industry. And uh, we are also uh, the uh, one of the major contributors uh, behind Italy, which is the lead country for the SKLO digital signal processing, uh, which activity will be led by the Raman Research Institute with contributions from other SK India consortium partners. And again, a lot of the final building of the hardware will happen uh, with, in industry. And we also have a role in the SKA mid uh, low frequency, the band one, which is the lowest frequency uh, receiver uh, to actually build the horn antenna and uh, integrate it with the receiver and uh, supply it to the SKA. And this again uh, will be involving industry to, to build these things uh, for the order of uh, 120 antennas. Uh, well, actually, it will replace even the, uh, no, it won't replace the Meerkat, there will be equivalent one, so it will be for 122 antennas. And we are also uh, uh, playing uh, some role in the science data processing uh, work, where there is a team uh, which is working on the Pulsar search software, PSS, uh, for designing the software that will help automatically detect Pulsars in large numbers from both the SK mid and the SK low. And so overall, our contribution is pegged at around 6 to 7% of the total construction cost of the SKA and a commensurate amount for the um, running costs uh, of the SKA uh, in, uh, as it gets uh, operational. In addition to this, there are plans to develop things in the country, uh, which are not direct contributions to the SKA. So uh, we will have a SKA regional data center in India. Uh, where we will be able to host a good amount of the SKA data and uh, especially the ones which may be more relevant to teams from India uh, that you know, were working on the science projects in the SKA. And th this uh, will also have a significant human resource development program. Uh, in fact, uh, Nirupam and Tirth are both actively involved in defining this human resource development program and uh, how and in consultation with the members of the SKA India consortium so that we can get uh, many more uh, younger people uh, involved uh, um, right from the beginning, uh, whether it is, you know, GRF, SRF or postdocs or uh, other positions. Uh, also technical human resource development for helping with the technical activities. And in addition to this, there's a small component of having an in-house R&D program, which is complementary to the work one is doing in the SKA, because one would like to try out new technologies which may become relevant for the full SKA, the phase two SKA. And uh, so there will be uh, some amount of uh, resources that we've asked for in the project proposal to support uh, this kind of activity. So um, uh, right, so I, uh, I think this is probably now a bit of repetition of what I've already said. And uh, that sort of brings me to the end in terms of summarizing. Um, and here I have the summary, I won't read it out. I'll leave it there and then take if, uh, questions if there are any.
Thank you, Jashwant. Uh, so now, if the participants have any question, please raise your hand and then, or you can type and then you will be able to unmute and ask the question. Maybe I'll stop sharing also. I'll just, and then if it's needed, I can start it again. Hi, Yashwan. Yes, yes. Uh, so you showed this, uh, the, it's one of the pictures of the uh, SK mead, which had different feeds, which are off-centered. Yes. So is is it going to be an uh, altazimuth kind of mount and the feed will rotate or the rotation will be no so it's because of, oh, sorry so let me just uh, oops uh, where did it go uh, i shouldn't have stopped the sharing one minute huh here it is okay so first is that it is a what is called a offset gregorian the the antenna different okay. from the jmrt which is a uh, prime focus so there are two things there Gregorian means the focus is not at the primary uh, uh, focus, it is a secondary focus, right? So right. The, the waves are reflected from the sub reflector and then come to the focus. You had another one which had the feeds up there. Yeah, and the number two is that it is an offset from so, uh, so that it can reduce the blockage of the antenna. Uh, and uh, so that those are the two features of the design. So you can sort of see it here. So you see, when you look at this antenna, you can see all of the antenna surface. There's nothing blocking pretty much. That is what is called an offset design. And what happens there is that you uh, you cut the parabola uh, not symmetrically around its axis, but uh, asymmetrically. And so that the focus is not directly above the center of the aperture, right? And so that gives you reduced blockage of the incoming radiation and gives you a better um, performance of the antenna and uh, the second is that you reflect it and bring it to a secondary focus uh, and like this and the different frequency feeds uh, like <coughs> are mounted on this secondary focus which can rotate uh, just like the JMRT prime focus rotates and brings the different uh, feeds to the secondary focus. Yeah, so I was asking, uh, so, so the field rotates with respect to, for an altazimuth antenna, the field rotates in the sky, right? And yes. So, uh, so it, it, uh, what, ha what happens in this case, because the feed is, uh, I mean, the feed cannot go around the... No, no. So the feed doesn't have to rotate, right? I mean, no, even, the feed... even in the JMRT, the feed does not rotate as the antenna follows the object in the sky, right? The feed is always illuminating the dish. So here, the feed is illuminating the secondary reflector, which is illuminating the dish. I mean, if you think of it as a transmission problem, the reception problem is just the inverse of that. So I'm not sure I understood your question that, um, um, that what is it that you're worried about as the antenna rotates while following the source? No, no. So I was worried about, uh, so how much is the uh, asymmetry in the beam uh, will play a role here? No, in fact, that uh, it is, uh, first, uh, it is not any worse than uh, any other altazimuth mount antenna. Uh, but if you ask, is it as good as an e effective equatorial mount kind of a thing? Yes, then the answer is no. But then, you know, there is enough techniques now available to handle those kind of things, including uh, varying uh, some variations in the beam shape as the antenna rotates. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Kanan? Hi, hello. Yes. Uh, ha, hello, yes, uh, so Can you just tell us uh, more about uh, this uh, current status of uh, SK India Regional Data Center. Um, yeah. So uh, what we have now is uh, the uh, there is plans that we are just starting now to build a small prototype regional data center. Uh, and uh, the very initial seed activity is just starting, but 
the moment our main project proposal uh, is approved, uh, which we are hoping will happen by later this year, then that allows us uh, formally to first build a smaller prototype center over the first uh, couple of years and uh, use it and learn from it and then go in for the um, uh, final data center. So um, our aim is to, um, with this prototype data center, which, uh, you know, if the funding and everything comes through at the expected time scale, uh, to be ready in, say, say two years uh, from now, which will, uh, you'll say, what will you do with this? So we are going to use it to host, say, for example, UGMRT data, as well as data from other observatories, uh, which is really, you know, finally what you want to do to be able to take data from SKA locations and host it here and uh, use that as a training ground, both for how to build and uh, maintain such large data centers, as well as for the user community to start uh, using uh, such large data, uh, uh, um, you know, avail uh, available uh, at a place in India, including the developing the required analysis pipelines to, you know, get the best results. And what we'd like to do is to uh, do this first with, uh, say, UGMRT data and, you know, learn from there and uh, build it up. And so, again, if, uh, I've, uh, I didn't get who was asking that question, but if you're interested... Uh in joining that exercise, you are more than welcome to do that. Uh, so, uh, this is Kanan from Presidents. Uh -huh, yes, Kanan. So, of course, since you are a member of yeah. the uh, activities, then you know that. And so, Yogesh uh, is uh, from NCRA has been uh, coordinating that. And uh, we have been talking about, once again, I think he mentioned that in the last SKIC meeting also, that uh, we are inviting uh, people who are interested to join in in the effort for uh, both defining and then building and then using the prototype data center. Okay, okay, thank you. Krishan, do you have another question? Sorry, Yashwant, the follow up to Kanan's question. Yes. So, will the data center will have some type of computational abilities also if somebody wants to run? Uh... So, there will be some amount of computational uh, facility available as compared to just a pure data storage. But how much that will be, how will it work? That's part of this thing of uh, defining it and then trying out in the prototype and then seeing how it works and then scaling it to the final thing. Of course, in this whole business, there will be certain guidelines from the SK for the final data center as to what it should uh, meet. And uh, one would be somewhat constrained by that also. But even there, if you want additional computing capability on top of what the minimum SKO wants, one can always add that depending on the needs. Yeah, so adding that will be very nice because yes. I mean, once this type of data comes, most of the places will be out of capability of yes. So it's correct that the SKA uh, uh, data center is not meant to be just purely a storage uh, place. Okay, any other any other question from any of the participants? So, uh, Yashwant, one uh, thing maybe uh, you know you have already mentioned it, but maybe you uh, can uh, make it a bit more clear. A lot of the participants in this school are actually early career students, they are in their masters and, you know, first year, second year, PhD, maybe. And uh, one question they will have in mind is that, um, of course, this is very exciting and there is uh, in interest overlap in terms of science, but what will be their uh, to do thing to get more involved and to contribute? So what, what will be the steps for this early career uh, researcher? So I think there are two parts to this, depending on what stage of your work you are in. If you are just sort of, you know, just starting your PhD, uh, then you may be choosing your topic and you could see uh, what you choose uh, in vis-a-vis -vis the SK India science case. Um, it also a little bit depends on where you are, which institution and organization and um, who may be potential guides and uh, so on. But, you know, uh, if you want help and advice on those, then, you know, two of the most 
relevant people are there in this uh, workshop, uh, which is Tirth and uh, Nirupam to talk to for these things. And they can certainly direct you to others who can then help you. If you're in a bit later stage, uh, let's say just finishing PhD, and you're looking for what your next step should be, and uh, some of your interests um, uh, align with or overlap with the SKA science cases, then you could again look and see that uh, whether you um, you know, try for a postdoc, which is uh, at a place where there is more focus on SKA related science so that you uh, keep building up in, in that direction. And, uh, then, and then you are more, um, uh, more ready for taking up a position, uh, say, you know, five years from now, six years from now, when the actual SKA science is supposed to begin. Uh, so those are two kinds of things I would say. Um, I think none of the, the people who are in this school would sort of be in the situation where they are looking for a GRF or SRF or a PhD position, say two years from, I mean, a year or two from now, which is when we will be fully launching our human resource development program. Uh, but you can certainly advise your uh, juniors about these possibilities. Uh, um, um, I don't know. Uh, I think I've sort of covered the points, but in fact, Nirupa Menti, you all may have, uh, you know, some more angles or insights into these aspects and happy for you all to comment. No, I think that that sort of uh, sum up. Yeah. I mean, I guess one of the things is whether the, you are a group uh, as a group um offers something for these early uh, career people in terms of getting them more prepared for science with the SKA. Those are the kind of things you all may have been addressing even in uh, during the workshop, but, uh, but you know, maybe Tirth is a better place to comment on that. Yes, yeah, so in, uh, so we actually had an earlier uh, activity also which which was more like in a workshop format. So this is more a school format where there are introductory lectures covering the basic topics yes. and so on. And then we also had this one week um, uh, workshop where um, there, there was exposure of, you know, discussion about research work that is going on and presentation of that work and then exposure to various things and plan of what can be done and so on is uh, coordinated by um, Tanun also to a large extent, yeah. So uh, people who are part of um, the SKUR uh, group or who participated on that workshop and then participating in the school, we, we have this thing. And similarly, I guess other uh, science working groups are also organizing various activities uh, like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so I don't um, see any other hand raised. So maybe uh, one more last time I'll check if in, if any of you have a question, please raise your hand if you want to ask something now. Okay, if not, then yeah, I don't see any other uh, hand raised. So let's uh, thank Yashwan for this um, very nice talk presenting the overview of um, SK as well as uh, telling us about the aspect of um, India's participation in it. And uh, you know, we look forward to uh, India joining uh, this thing very soon uh, and, you know, future uh, more more uh, close involvement with the SKA so that uh, the participants on, of this uh, school are the people who will be actually um, start working with uh, the data from SKA. Yes. Okay, so with that, we wrap up the session. Uh, thank you everyone for joining.